Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And interviews are conducted here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. The local administrator of the interviews is Brian Powers, who's our cameraman today. And today's date is the 18th of April, 2018, and it's a Wednesday. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing the Marine Corps veteran, Walter Douglas Galladay. Yes. And Mr. Galladay, it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. And, um, all right just to call you Walt or Walter? Yes, either one. Okay. I answer to both. Well, Walt, if you would, uh, what's your date of birth and where were you born? Uh, uh, date of birth is September 23rd, 1943. I was born in Fort Benning, Georgia. My dad was in the Army. I see. And uh, your full name is Walter Douglas Galladay. Yes, I was named after my grandfather. I see. And your father's name? Edward Milton Galladay. And your mother's name? Uh, Victorine Louise Pearsall. And I have a second mother. And Patricia Jane Gallatin Galladay. Uh, and your birth mother was uh, Victory and Louise Will Williams. She passed away in uh, 1997 and loved her dearly. And then uh, about uh, eight, 10 years later, uh, my stepmother of 50 plus years, uh, she adopted me. I see. And uh, I'm her sole surviving son. Good. And your birth mother's maiden name? Was Williams. Williams. And. Um, where you say your father was a military man? He was military. He went in the uh, the army in about 1930. And about 1935, he went to uh, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. He was at Schofield Barracks, uh, and he uh, on uh, Pearl Harbor uh, when it was attacked, he was a company first sergeant on duty that day. Uh, my biological mother was there with my two brothers, because it was a peacetime environment in 1941. Yes, yes. And so they were all there during the attack. I see. Did your father tell you uh, much about the attack? My father didn't talk hardly about anything military related. I, uh, uh, being a veteran, uh, just like the Vietnam vets, I really can't talk their language. And so I couldn't talk his language. So we really didn't talk about it. I see. But he was first sergeant there. He was a first sergeant at Pearl, at, uh, Pearl Harbor. And then following that, uh, they sent him to Fort Benning for Warren Officer School. And that's where I was born, for Benny. I see. Um, was you, and your mother was there also then? Oh, yes. And uh, was your mother employed or anything? Uh, I think she, she may have worked in, uh, in restaurants or, or, or drugstores with cafes, with uh, counters. Uh, she may have done a little of that, uh, but I think she uh, she was raising uh, my two brothers predominantly. Um, what, what's, you were born in, at Fort Benning, you said, right? Yes. And uh, what schools did you go to, Walter? I wasn't, uh, I, I only lived in Fort Benning for a short period of time. Uh, when I really realized what was happening in my environment, I was living in San Diego, California. I grew up in San Diego uh, in uh, a, a little community called Normal Heights uh, in, uh, in, the, in the late 40s to the mid 50s. Was your dad still in the service while you were in California? Uh, my parents were divorced about that time. Uh, the late 40s, they divorced. I really never lived with my father that I knew. Okay. Uh, they were always separate. He was overseas on, a, on a, he was overseas for Korea. Uh, and then he was overseas for Japan. Uh, he was on the staff of MacArthur, General MacArthur, at the end of the war. He spoke fluent uh, Japanese. He was an uh, intelligence officer at the end of the war. And uh, so uh, uh, they, uh, uh, my mother did not live with him overseas in Japan. He lived uh, alone doing his duty over there. And she stayed in San Diego, California. And did they get divorced while he was overseas? or? Well, I think he came back. He came back at different periods of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in the late 40s they got a divorce. Yeah. And um, what did your mother do after the divorce in California? She, uh, 
She was a Rosie the Riveter for, for some period of time. She worked on the struts of B-52s. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, I have pictures of her uh, mm -hmm. uh, working the assembly line for uh, the, uh, I think it was Boeing, uh -huh. uh, for the, uh, the struts, building the struts in San Diego. Uh, and then uh, in later times, I, uh, I, I, I couldn't say what she did, because about the mid-50s, I went to live with my dad in Arizona. I see. So did you go to school while you were in California? I went to school in uh, San Diego, uh, elementary through uh, junior high. Graduated junior high, and then uh, I went to uh, Bisbee, Arizona in 1958, and started the 10th grade in Bisbee High School and graduated there in 61. Uh, uh, were you living with your dad in Bisbee? Yes. Was he still in the military then? Uh, no, he retired in 57. I see. He had 27 years service. He retired in uh, 1957. And uh, What rank was he? Uh, Chief Warrant Officer W-4. Right. Is what he was. Yeah. And yeah. his name again? Edward Milton Gollum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so you graduated from high school there in Bisbee? I graduated high school in Bisbee in 61. Uh, and before I graduated, I was in the Marine Corps. I see. So you went down and joined before you graduated? It was, I think it was called the Late Entry Program or something. Right. In uh, about May of uh, 61, I uh, joined the Marine Corps, and in August, I went active duty. Um, and how old were you then? 17. 17? Yeah. And you finished high school? Oh, yeah. 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 I got my uh, yeah. diploma. Um, what, what, after you joined, uh, tell us what, you know, where you were sent to first. Uh, and, uh, I went into active duty in August of 61, the day after the, uh, the uh, Iron Curtain went up in Berlin, Germany. That was 13 August, and I went into Corps 14 August. Of course, I was too young to really understand anything about that at the time, but now being a historian, I kind of look back on those things. And uh, so we had uh, 12 uh, weeks of uh, boot camp at uh, San Diego. And uh, what's the name of that base? Uh, it's called Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, I How was. How many uh, weeks of basic? Uh, 12. 12 weeks of basic. No, no leave, no nothing, just mm -hmm. Marine Corps. Tell us about your basic training there. <laughs> they, uh, they have a, a, a large uh, uh, asphalt area, I think they call it the grinder. And uh, it may have been a mile in circumference or longer, I don't know. And uh, when we first started out, the platoon could, we were lucky if we had half the platoon run around half the grinder. And the rest of them were falling out early on when you first got there. But by the end of the 12 weeks, we could run it continuously. And, and consequently, the drill instructor would stand in the center and have us run around him. Okay. Because you could run continuously, just like you can do at a marathon. Okay. People yeah. get used to it. And we were used to that. We could do that. And we had, uh, we had, uh, uh, you had your typical calisthenics. You had uh, 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 exercise areas that, uh, I, I forget, right now the name escapes me what these places were that you, uh, uh, you went through uh, 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 over, uh, over obstacles, obstacle course. Mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't done that in 60 years. Okay. And uh, so they had those things. And back in those days, you could do it. <laughs> Can't right. do anything now. Okay. And then about uh, five or six weeks in, they issued us M1 rifles. And uh, so we went to the rifle range and uh, did a week at the rifle range and qualified. Uh, few did not. Most did. Uh, and then we, uh, we, we came back from there. They typically had a long march to get to the rifle range and a long march back. 10, 12, 14, 16 miles. I don't know the distance, you just right. you march it, okay? And uh, <laughs> at the range, you also uh, uh, fired uh, 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 bazookas, you uh, fired uh, Mod Deuce uh, 50 caliber machine guns, you, you uh, uh, Marine Corps at that time had Ontos, uh, small track vehicles that were cheap tanks. You put six 106 recoilless rifles on a small track vehicle and shoot it and uh, I think the uh, the uh, the driver and the shooters are all standing outside 
I was cheap tank, as I said. And, uh, and we, uh, we saw those fired. You threw grenades, you, uh, you fired uh, uh, Browning automatic rifles. Uh, we did poorly on that. Our, our squad did, uh, or the platoon did, fired uh, the Browning automatic rifles, so we had to run them back to the, uh, the armory. <laughs> Everybody else's rifles besides ours, so that, that wasn't a lot of fun. 20 pound rifle. Yeah. Yeah, those are kind of heavy. Uh, but uh, by the seventh, eighth week, you, you're, you're really, uh, you're marching well, you're in good formation. Uh, you understand the drill instructor very, very well, his commands, even though they don't sound like English. But he, he could get you to march uh, any way he wanted, uh, front, rear, left, right, oblique. Uh, and we all snapped too. We did very well. It was, uh, it was, it was fun, enjoyable. Uh, graduation came about the 12th week. And uh, all the platoons were graduating, marched past in review of the, uh, of the officers and the visitors, the public, uh, parents, my dad and uh, mom showed up from Arizona and my other mother is still living in California, she showed up. So everybody was there to uh, see graduation. So that was it for 12 weeks. I think it was about mid-November that we graduated. Just one question there. You said some guys didn't, uh, some guys did not, uh, they failed at the rifle range. Did, what did they do with the guys that failed? They would uh, have them run around the platoon as the platoon is marching back. And they would run around the platoon, literally, carrying a chair. And whenever the drill instructor wanted to sit down, they better be there with a the chair so he could sit down and relax, rest and relax. And when he got up, then they started carrying the chair and running around the platoon again. So, uh, they, so they, they did graduate with you. They graduated. Oh, yeah. yeah. They just they, they, they didn't get a shooting medal, and they got a little bit more hardship from the drill instructor. Uh, exactly what it was, I don't know, because I, yeah. I qualified. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I didn't have that problem. What were the different levels of qualifying on the right uh, way? There's uh, expert, uh, sharpshooter, and marksman. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's uh, different scores that you uh, you achieve uh, for those three, and it's been so long, I don't know what the right. score cutoffs were. And I have no idea how they do it nowadays with these new rifles and the scopes and the, and the laser, laser targets. And we had old peep sights in the M1 mm -hmm. is what we had. That's an M1 Grand you're referring it's to. It's an M1 Grand, uh, eight round, uh, eight round clip. Uh, and I still shoot it to this day. I shoot it with the Marine Corps and I shoot it with the American Legion. I'm on an honor guard for uh, funerals, veteran funerals. Right. So I still fire them today. I'm comfortable with the weapon. So you graduate, uh, you recall the date after your 12 weeks? It was in uh, November of 61. That's all I know. And they gave us about three or four hours of on post leave. We couldn't leave the post. Uh, you could spend a little bit of time with your family, and then you went back to your unit. And then they packed you up and shipped you off to, uh, I went to Camp Pendleton for uh, advanced infantry training. Where is that at? Camp Pendleton, California. I think it's outside Oceanside, California. Is that still down around San Diego? Yeah, it's north of San Diego. I would be guessing if I said 25, 30 miles north of it. That's a guess. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more outside Oceanside to the it's to the it's to the uh, the east of Oceanside. I think it surrounds it even goes to the waterline to the Pacific Ocean. The camp does, mm -hmm. and then it goes inward. I don't know how many miles, but I was stationed. I went there for advanced infantry training, and then following that, of about a month, I was on leave for a, a couple of weeks, and then uh, I came back to Camp Pendleton for a year of duty. Uh, what is advanced military, advanced uh, infantry, infantry training? training. Uh, in, uh, it, uh, they, they take you over Hillendale, uh, marching, uh, firing weapons, uh, 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 playing, uh, playing Marine up on top of mountaintops uh, uh, with, the, with the enemy coming at you. Okay, and you're, you're shooting blanks at them and they're shooting blanks back at you, not close enough that you injure anybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, 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 it's the techniques of, of, uh, of uh, combat. Uh, 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 I can't speak so well to it because I was not a combat Marine, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so I didn't go on from there. I didn't go on to an infantry uh, battalion. 
uh, brigade, regiment, or the division. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a, I went to a support uh, battalion. Uh, uh, I was a, in a support unit at Camp Pendleton. Uh, what does uh, that's after your advanced training? How long yes. was advanced training? Uh, it was about four or five weeks. <coughs> is and, what it was. Uh, and uh, is there uh, an identifying number to the support group you went to? Uh, there was, but I don't remember it. And I it, have a photograph of the unit that's about uh, 30 inches wide, and it showed us all, all of us in it uh, for the, uh, they took a, 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 a group photograph of all of us. I still got that photograph. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the identification is on there, the unit, but I don't remember what it was. It was there at Camp Pendleton. At so. Camp Pendleton, yeah. And after you leave that, most of the people that uh, that went in, most of the Marines that went in with me were were signed up for four years active, two inactive. I signed up for three active and three inactive, so I stayed behind at Camp Pendleton. And most of the Marines I, I signed up with, they went to uh, Okinawa. And I never got out of the states with the uh, with the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. It was a year at Pendleton, and then I, I took a, a transfer to Headquarters Marine Corps in uh, Arlington, Virginia. What what would you call it? Headquarters Marine Corps. Okay. It was uh, Henderson Hall uh, in Arlington, Virginia, off Columbia Pike. Right across I, from Washington, D.C.? Yes. I went there in uh, in uh, December of 62. Uh, mm -hmm. I transferred there. And uh, I was there from December of 62 till uh, August of 64. What were your duties there? I was an uh, administrative uh, man, called an admin man, uh, clerical. I did the morning reports, uh, and uh, and uh, I was pretty good at that typing. So I do a lot of typing. I, that's what I do, working on my books. I do all the typing, but uh, I did the morning reports and anything else they needed from a, a headquarters uh, admin uh, man. Yeah, some people we call ourselves the Remington Raiders. For the Remington typewriter. I got it. The Remington yeah. typewriter. Yeah. Um, what rank were you at that time? What I was, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps active duty, I was a Lance Corporal E3. Uh, later on, and many years later, I got a copy of my full personnel file folder, and I found out I, I, uh, I passed the E4 test about a year before I got out of active duty. But at that time, in 63, uh, uh, it was a peacetime environment, essentially. So there wasn't really a turnover of Marines or other military oh, personnel. And so uh, it was pretty stagnant. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you maybe have 10 E4 slots show up and you got 100 uh, E3s eligible. So it's right. just very difficult to get promoted. Right. Uh, later on, uh, when Vietnam became hot, uh, turnover was very rapid. Yeah. I found that to be the case in the Pentagon. Yeah. Um, what are you working out of? Are you working out of a military base or? Uh, at uh, Henderson Hall, headquarters Marine Corps, they were uh, World War II wooden barracks, and, is what they were. And they were across the street from headquarters Marine Corps where uh, the, uh, the Commandant and Marine Corps and his staff worked out of uh, red brick buildings, as I remember. Uh, and, and is uh, that in Arlington itself? It's in Arlington itself. Is that where Marine Corps headquarters is then? Yes. Uh, now, I, I couldn't tell you today, maybe portions of the uh, Commandant and the staff are in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, at, from what I remember at my time, they were, they were across the street. I think it was called the Navy Annex, uh, if I remember correctly, but that was 60 years ago, 50. Right. Okay. Uh, and he was stationed over there, and we were in uh, uh, wooden barracks uh, uh, from World War II. Uh, I was back uh, about five or ten years ago. Visited the place, and it's all uh, it's all been uh, torn down. The wood's all gone. And it's all red brick buildings now. And really, I think the Marine Corps are their tenants on an army base. Okay, it's still called Henderson Hall, but I think it's Army Navy Army Marine Corps base. And the uh, the Army, I think, owns it. Uh -huh. Okay, that's my understanding. Yeah. But I took a tour of the place just to check it out. It's right adjacent to the to uh, Arlington Cemetery. If I know my uh, coordinates correctly, I think it's on the southwest corner of Arlington Cemetery. Okay. You will find Henderson Hall. 
are still today. Oh, it's there, yeah, today, a brand new red brick building. Mm -hmm. I don't know how new they are. They just look new to me. Yeah. Okay, southwest corner, Arlington Cemetery. While you were uh, stationed there, then uh, you come in contact with any famous Marines or people of that nature while you're there? No, I can't say I did. I, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, uh, my uh, the the personnel I had uh, most experience with were my first sergeant, my, and uh, the uh, the sergeant major at times, a lieutenant, and the the captain of the uh, the company. Uh, those are the people I dealt with. Okay, uh, no, I I I can't say I I saw any significant Marines there. We had uh, women Marines on the base. Uh, we also had, uh, it was a training location for uh, Embassy Guard Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a training location for them, but I really didn't have much to do with them. Uh, the women Marines we did because uh, we were lower ranks and they were lower ranks and when we had Friday night, uh, the, the dance, uh, they would show up and we'd have a good time. Where did you have the dance of that? Uh, it was in the enlisted club uh, up through E3. Mm -hmm. And uh, they so uh, they, uh, they so the, the women Marines came and and off post uh, ladies came also. And you had uh, an enlisted club then, an NCO club. They had an NCO club. club. I never got there. Yeah. Uh, and they had an NCO club, and I think they had a staff NCO club. And again, I think I only heard about it. I I never visited the locations. I wasn't qualified. Uh, Were you involved in any classified? Uh, Materials? Uh, not at, uh, not while well in the Marine Corps, no. Okay. Uh, I, I never touched any. In, in subsequent years, I, I handled all levels of classification. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Marine Corps, no. Mm -hmm. I did meet my, my future wife while I was in the Marine Corps there. How did you meet her? <laughs> and what, was, what is her name? Uh, her name is, uh, her, 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 she goes by Peggy. She, she doesn't like Margaret. Uh, but I met her in Christmas of 62, right after I came to uh, Washington, D.C., Headquarters Marine Corps. Right after Christmas holidays, I went downtown to Washington, D.C. In D.C., you could drink at age 18. I don't know if it's the case anymore. But uh, so uh, the Marines uh, would leave Virginia, travel across the, uh, the Potomac and go into D.C., and they could drink at age 18. And so I went in there and I met her at a Rand's nightclub on 14th and 8th Street. That's where I met her. Uh, she was with another gal and so I, uh, I uh, hooked up with a sailor there and had the sailor go visit the other girl and I went to Peggy. And uh, for me it was love at first sight from a wife who was get lost Marine. <laughs> What's her, what's her full name, though? Uh, Margaret Irene uh, Nation. Uh, what's her maiden name? Nation. Nation? N -A -T? Nation. N-A-T-I-O-N? Yes. N-A-T-I-O-N. Yes. And, uh, uh, but she goes by Peggy. She doesn't like Margaret at all. Right. And, uh, well, get Lost Marine. Huh? Get Lost Marine. I, but it, 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 over a period of time, though, I, I wooed her over. I, I won her over. And uh, did, was she working at that time? Uh, yes, but I can't tell you where. I mean, we were just dating. I mean, uh, it, it was nothing serious in uh, early 63. It wasn't until late 63 that we got engaged. And uh, it was in six, early 65 we got married. What date did you get married? Uh, March uh, 14th of 65. 65. So we just celebrated our 53rd uh, wedding anniversary. So, um, you had been discharged then before you got married. Yes, yes. Because now you got discharged what in August of sixty four. Well, let's let's not say discharged. I was released from active duty. Right. In August of sixty four, I and didn't get my discharge. You still got three years inactive. Three inactive. So actually, I was I was married before I got my discharge. Okay. I got married in August, in March of sixty five. I got the discharge in May of 67. Right. Okay. Right. I got my discharge the same point in time they were calling up the inactive reserves for Vietnam. And I told them I got a discharge. They say, well, we don't want you then. I said, okay. It was just luck. It, yeah. was, it was luck on everything. Yes. Um, so 
when you got discharged in August of 60, uh, when you were released from active duty in August yeah. of 64, did you stay yes, in Washington or Arlington? Yes, I did. I, uh, I worked for, for about a year with a private company downtown and uh, that was going nowhere. So I, I applied uh, for a, a position as an ad, in admin again, clerical, with the, uh, the uh, Pentagon. And I don't know if I applied straight to the Joint Chiefs of Staff or just some locale in the Pentagon. And I was assigned there, I don't know that. Uh, but I end up working for the, uh, the I think the, the, I think it's called the Joint Directorate. It, it, that's a long time ago. But it was part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and it was there I had a TS clearance. I started with a TS clearance. And I handled uh, highly classified documents there. I was not an analyst, I was clerk, so I did page changes. Filed documents, put them away. I went and uh, got them out of the, uh, the files for the, uh, the, uh, the military who would uh, take them down to the, to the joint secretariat and they would review them, make their decisions on them and then send them back when they were done with them. No computers at that time, it was all paper copy. And, uh, and after about a year, I got uh, promoted to a higher position where I handled uh, war plans. Uh, it was a, a higher classification of uh, clearance, top secret, PSYOP, ESI. Uh, and uh, so I handled those. War plans? Yeah. PSYOP is single integrated op plan, uh, extremely sensitive information. TS, the PSYOP, ESI. Those are additional classifications over above TS. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to handle them based upon a need to know. And again, I didn't, I was not an analyst on them. I just handled them. I stored them, documented them, properly destroyed them or copied them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of responsibility with it. I did that for about, from uh, 66 through 68, I did that. 66 or 68? Yeah. And is that, you're working for the government then? I was working for the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a civilian, as a GS-5 civilian. Okay. And who pays you? Uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Okay. All right. You're not a civilian then, so to speak? Or are I you? am a civilian. Okay. But a civil service employee. Okay. Civil, How's that? So, yes. Now civil I'm, service employee. I sense. started a GS-3. Uh, after a year, I got promoted to GS-5, somebody left. I did the, I always remember, I did handle the Vietnam War plan. It was about 12 inches thick, as I remember. Did you ever read it? <laughs> no, we, I, I was clerical, I didn't read. Okay. Okay, all we did was make page changes. Okay. And, and, and put it back in a proper fashion to, to put it in the file, and, and when they wanted it and brought forward, we brought it forward. How thick was it? I would say it was about 12 inches that I remember. Wow. Okay, it was thick. Why did, all, you only leave her, why did you only stay there two years? I stayed uh, a little over three years with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was in a, <clears throat> late 68, I figured out what I wanted to be and it wasn't clerical for the rest of my life. So with the, uh, the uh, uh, GI Bill, I started going to college at Northern Virginia Community College in late, in, in, uh, late 68. In, in that case, uh, at that period of time, it was called data processing. And uh, with that, that was my gateway entry point uh, with the Department of Treasury Bureau of Public Debt. They hired me in 69 as a computer programmer. Uh, uh, I was essentially a trainee at that time. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, they were writing COBOL. I don't know if you know what COBOL means or what it stands for. It's common business oriented language. But it was a language used by, uh, by a lot of uh, organizations, federal agencies at that time. And so I uh, started writing COBOL for Treasury Department. They were converting their um, FHA debentures from punch cards to magnetic tape. And we were writing programs to convert those, read the cards, put them on magnetic tape, and then they would use tape from then on. We didn't have disk at that time. There was no computer disk at that time. It was all mag tape. And uh, so I was, uh, as a COBOL programmer, I was writing programs. The programs would go on punch cards. 
And so you could have a thick deck of a thousand punch cards for your COBOL program. They read it in and convert it to uh, to magnetic, uh, not to magnetic, excuse me, but to, uh, again, the name escapes me, it's been so long ago, uh, convert it to a format that the computer can read it in, okay? And then uh, we would, uh, you could produce reports from that. Uh, and uh, and I did that for, for a couple of years with Treasury in the Bureau of Public Debt. It's right off 14th Street, right across the 14th Street Bridge is where Bureau of Public Debt resides. And uh, I was there through uh, uh, 69 and 70, I guess about, I think 69, 70. I guess about 72 is when I, I went, I uh, was hired with the Department of the Army uh, as uh, again writing COBOL for them. Uh, I saw a better advancement with them and they had newer computers. So I went with them and they were working in uh, Washington, D.C. I don't know where it was. It's the U.S. Army Finance and Comptroller Information Systems Command. Big long title. And uh, I worked for them for about a year or so, and then they transferred me to Military District of Washington. They were down in what they call Tempo ABC, and that's the Fort, Ma Fort McNair. I think those buildings are gone now, Tempos. And Tempos, they were wooden barracks again from World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I worked for the Military District of Washington, the COBOL program, for a couple of years. I was advancing through the grades, GS 7, 9, 11. Uh, I, uh, I think I, uh, I, I, let's see, I was at 11 with the Military District of Washington. And in uh, 1973, the Finance and Comptroller Information Systems Command was transferring its, its physical location to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, inside Indianapolis. So I took a promotion, GS-12, went with them to uh, Fort Ben and uh, moved out of the Washington, D.C. area, and that was a good move. What year was that? That was uh, in late uh, 72, early 73. Um, that time. Yeah. Um, what's your wife doing all this time? At some point in time, she started, I think she re, uh, quit working, started taking care of our two children. We had a son born in January of 69 and a daughter born in March of 72. And their names? Uh, they, the boy's name is Scott Richard Galladay, and the daughter was, uh, uh, is, uh, she is uh, Christine Marie Galladay, and now she's Christine Marie Hazard. What's your last name? Hazard, H-A-S-S-E-R-T. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, they were born at that time. And uh, so she, uh, I think she essentially stayed home at that time, became a housewife, took care of the children. Right. And, uh, and so that's what she was doing. Uh, we moved to uh, Woodbridge, Virginia, a couple of years before we left Washington, D.C. And uh, I was able to buy a, a Now, when you're, uh, huh? when you're working for these organizations, do you, are, you, are you in contact with any high-ranking military men that are historical figures or anything? No, not, not at all. I was a civilian. My bosses were uh, GS-12s, GS-13s. Uh, not, I mean, occasionally you would see the commander of the Finance Information System Command. He could have been a two or three star general. I don't remember his name at that time. Uh, later on in life, I worked with high ranking military. Okay. But early in my career, I did not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I worked more with uh, what I considered higher ranking civilians. They were GS 12s, 13s, and 14s, maybe an occasional GS 15. And you're doing all this with a high school education? Uh, high school, but uh, as I say, in uh, '69, I started on the GS uh, GI Bill, right. and uh, and started uh, uh, taking a, a course with Northern Virginia Community College, uh, which was uh, leading towards an associate in applied science degree, two-year degree in data processing technology. I started in uh, in late '68, and uh, in uh, in the summer of '73, I graduated with my two-year degree. It took me five years to get the two-year degree. I was going to night school and working daytime. So you're one of the first programmers then. So I was speak. an early programmer. I can't say I was one of the first. No, yeah. but I was an early programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, and uh, so uh, uh, 
uh, when I, after the, uh, I got my two-year degree in uh, Virginia and we transferred to, to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, I then found I could continue on with my uh, studies in computer science with, uh, it's called IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. I, uh, I went back to my studies for the four-year degree there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that was, uh, I think about 74, 75, I started there. And uh, at that time, I was a GS-12 computer programmer. They call them computer specialists also because we were starting to design systems besides writing programs. And so if you're multi-talented in several fields, you would become a computer specialist. And that's what I became in uh, Fort Ben Harrison. And that continued on for uh, through uh, 1980. In, in later years, uh, that about 77, 78, I specialized more in designing uh, automation systems for headquarters army. And, uh, and as such, they started sending me a lot of travel and TDY and I had to fall out of college. I mean, I was going two weeks straight TDY. I, uh, I wasn't at home even for the weekend. So I couldn't continue my studies and I felt the, uh, my career was, was going in the right direction. So I, I dropped out of college and continued on with my uh, civil service career. Uh, about 1980, uh, we had so many uh, GS-12s competing for a few GS-13 positions that I saw that I wasn't getting anywhere there. So I, I took a, a leap and, and, and transferred to Europe. I took the whole family with me for a three year tour in uh, Germany, Zweibrück and Germany. Uh, who are you working for then still? In Germany? Yeah. When I went to uh, Germany in uh, 1980, I went to work for a headquarters, a uh, USER and 7th Army. Uh, U.S. Army Europe and 7th Army, the combined uh, title. Uh, but I was stationed at uh, an Army Kreuzberg Kasern in Zweibrück and Germany. And that's where we lived. The family lived with me there. and. Uh, I was there a year, as they say, if I back up a little bit, when I said I was at Fort Ben Harrison, we had maybe 20, 30 GS-12s competing for a couple of uh, GS-13 positions. Where I landed in Zweibrück in Germany, I was the sole GS-12 working for a GS-13. And after a year, he went home. The boss liked me, so he promoted me into that GS-13 position. So I became, that's, that's the time I became a, a supervisor of employees uh, and, uh, and got away from writing programs. I had probably 20 to 30 uh, employees working for me. Most of them were German, a few French, some Belgium, uh, all foreign nationals working for me. And uh, uh, we got along very well. And what are you producing there? They were, they were, uh, we foreigners. We had, uh, they were, they were uh, writing uh, uh, COBOL and other languages on IBM 360 equipment and later equipment. And they would, they would, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the results of the programs would produce uh, uh, orders for supplies to come from the states over to Europe, to army bases. Uh, and they would do uh, 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 exercises for uh, wartime exercises. In theory, the Russians, we were always planning on the Russians coming over, and they were coming uh, uh, down the, uh, the gap, the Fulda gap. Uh, this, long time ago, so it, a lot of these, uh, these words I used at that time that were common, uh, I, I, it's not my normal everyday language nowadays. But we, we exercised, did exercises uh, to, to, uh, to fight the Russians. Uh, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, maybe 10, 15 percent American civilians working on the post, and the other 60, 70, 80 percent were foreign nationals. 
we were adjacent, Ger Zweibrück in Germany is adjacent to uh, Metz, France, uh, its commuting distance. So we had a lot of, uh, of our of employees would commute daily from France into Germany. Some of the Belgians would, uh, they would stay uh, for during the week, I guess, and then go home on the weekend. Uh, I don't really know the details of that, mm -hmm. but I know we had Belgium employees there. But the French would commute daily. It was about, uh, if I said, 30 to 40 kilometers from from Germany to to uh, Metz, France. We were on the uh, the western edge of Germany, so we were in the uh, where they had the Siegfried Line, all the uh, the uh, the bunkers and things from World War II. We were in the middle of that on the German side. And Metz, France, was part of the uh, the uh, the Maginot Line. Mm -hmm. Okay, and being a military historian, I loved it. And I would take my son out. We would go visit all the bunkers and snoop around, and we just had a good time. Uh, my wife and daughter could care less about that subject, uh, but we had a good time uh, uh, looking at old bunkers that were still there. That's in the Alsace-Lorraine. No, that Alsace-Lorraine is is uh, east of us, probably 100, 200 kilometers is east of us, closer to the Rhine River, the Alsace-Lorraine area. I was in a Zargamin area of Germany, okay. uh, uh, right on the west side, Saarland, uh, Saarland? S-A-A-R. Yeah, Saarland, I think, was the capital of the area. Okay. Uh, but we had, uh, we had uh, Zweibrücken, Permazans, uh, Kontwisch, uh, and, uh, and I live in Zweibrücken, that stands for two bridges, uh, Zweibrücken. Uh, and so I was in Zweibrücken for probably through uh, uh, 85. And then they reorganized the army for the army information systems at that time. And so I was transferred from USER and 7th Army to uh, 73rd Signal Battalion, 2nd Signal Brigade, 5th uh, Signal Command, still staying in Zweibrücken, uh, but then they, out of that reorganization, they started reorganizing the titles of the of the staff and the uh, the managers, and uh, I took a position as an information management officer in uh, 85, 86, and so I went to work on the staff of the 73rd Signal Battalion. My boss was a lieutenant colonel. Now I'm starting to work directly with the military. Mm -hmm. My boss was a lieutenant colonel, uh, battalion commander, uh, and. Uh, I reported directly to him. I was essentially the S6 officer, uh, information systems officer. Uh, he was uh, he was dual hatted, if you will, as the battalion commander and the the, inf the and the chief information officer, if you will. The the commander was. They didn't call me a deputy and because they had a deputy commander of the battalion. So I was the the assistant director of the information management. And I was there two years, and that was in uh, Permazans, Germany. And then following that, I was finishing up a seven-year career, and it was time to come home to the States. So uh, I took a job with uh, 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 Information Systems Command Fort Hood. And I went there and took the position as the deputy director because there was no deputy commander. And my boss then was a full colonel. I was second in command, if you will, as a civilian. And uh, so now I'm working with the military a lot, Fort, much Fort, closer. Fort Hood is where? Uh, Fort Hood is adjacent to Killeen, Texas, Central <clears throat> Texas. You're about 60 miles north of Waco. No, excuse me, Austin. Austin, okay. You're about 60 miles north of Austin, Texas. Uh, you're maybe 30, 40 miles uh, southwest of Waco, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, so I was there in, uh, as uh, the deputy for, from uh, 87 to 89 as a GS-13. And uh, it, was, it was great duty uh, working for this uh, full colonel. And uh, we were on the, the, uh, the commander of that base was a three-star general. I forget his name now, escapes me. But again, at times I would see him, have interaction with him, uh, have interaction with the post commander who was a full colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, so at, at uh, my, my, this time of my career, I'm having more interaction with the higher level military. 
uh, all this time I, I've had a, either a TS clearance or a, or a secret clearance. Uh, if you understand uh, those clearances, if you don't have a need to have a TS clearance, they, they reduce you to secret. It's no uh, um, uh, uh, reflection on your part, it's just they don't need to have you to have that TS clearance. So most of the time in Europe I had a secret clearance. Uh, at ISC Fort Hood, I think they issued me a TS again, top secret, because I would go into a top secret area of the, of the command structure and, and, and not look at classified material, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I, I can have access to it in my position. But normally I don't touch it, but I'm, because I'm in that area, mm -hmm. they, I have the TS clearance and, and I've been properly vetted. Uh, every five years, I think you're you're vetted by the FBI, and I have a I have a lot of that paperwork in, in my possession. Uh, at uh, in uh, at the end of uh, '89, I don't know if you've ever been to Central Texas or uh, Fort Hood. No. But uh, uh, there's a lot of cowboys out there, and there's a lot of retired military, but there are very few retired civilians there. So I saw it in my best interest to get out of there because I was looking to retire at some point in time. So I, 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 I found that there was an opening in Cincinnati, Ohio for a GS-14 information management officer working for the, at that time it was called the Ohio River Division Army Corps of Engineers. Uh -huh. And so I applied for that position and was accepted in, uh, in, uh, uh, early 89 and uh, so I was in the process of moving my family out here in uh, about April May 89 and exactly at that time my my father passed away and uh, so he passed away in Arizona and the funeral was in Kansas and uh, so I managed to bring the family up here we dropped all our baggage and we got in the car and we drove to we're Kansas back. for the funeral yeah. And then I came back, and uh, 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 my mother will be buried out there, my, my second mother, my adopted mother, and I'll be buried out there. I've already got a spot right next to my dad. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, uh, I took a promotion, GS-14, and this position uh, now worked uh, directly for a, a one-star general, was my boss. And later on, the position was converted to two-star. So my boss became a two-star general. So you're asking if I had yeah. interaction with the military. I did. Uh, and uh, so the, the deputy was typically a full colonel, and, and the, the commander was a one- or two-star general. Uh, for, and later on, the name was changed from Ohio River to Great Lakes and Ohio River. And they expanded the number of uh, uh, engineer districts from four. Uh, there were four Louisville, Pittsburgh, Nashville, and uh, and uh, one of, oh Huntington, Huntington, four Army Engineer districts, and uh, in uh, about uh, the year 2000 or somewhere in there, they reorganized the Army Corps, and uh, they brought in three more districts: uh, Detroit, Buffalo, and uh, uh, oh uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, three more districts. So we had seven districts in our uh, division, Army Engineer Division. Uh, and I worked with the, the, uh, them as a, as a GS-14 uh, uh, Director of Information Management through September of 98 uh, when I retired. Uh, at that time, they were going through the process of changing the title from Director of Information Management to Chief Information Officer. But I, uh, I retired before they, uh, they, they changed my title. What year did you retire again? I retired in September of 98. At age 55. Were you here in Cincinnati at that time? Yes. At I, age 55? At age 55 with 36 years service. What, what's, what is the function of the, the mission of the Army Corps of Engineers? They, uh, I was information manager computer science, and, uh, but uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would be giving you my impression of what their mission is. They, they manage a the nation's waterways uh, in their locale, in their states, uh, and also they have a, a, a military program which overlaps the civilian program. 
uh, in days of old when the engineers were assigned waterways, like in the 37 flood, I think, they, I, I don't think that they were as, as, uh, as uh, uh, strongly uh, working in that area as after the flood occurred and uh, the, uh, the, the Congress and uh, the, the powers to be said the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers will manage the, the nation's waterways to prevent major incidents like this. You can't prevent them, but you can, you can hinder them to a degree. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of water reservoirs out here now. When, when there's heavy rains, the, the reservoirs will fill up and not cause the water to come down in the Little Miami, Great Miami, uh, or the Ohio so much. You'll still have flooding, but they can, they can manage it. So they, they manage the locks and dams the locks and dam. There's one dam, multiple locks. They, they corrected me on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they, uh, they have a, a military uh, uh, overlay uh, where the, uh, uh, at times that, uh, that uh, may be a little bit different uh, geographical area of where their area responsibility is. The military area is typically by state boundaries. The, the uh, civilian waterway management is more along the lines of where the waters initiate. The head stream mm -hmm. uh, is a starting point, and that might be where they might start. Like in the Ohio River Division, uh, when I first came here, we didn't have anything to do with the Great Lakes right. because the waters did not originate there. They originated on this side, and uh, so there was, the civilian uh, management uh, was different, uh, the starting points of the rivers. Uh, we went up to Pittsburgh, right. uh, the Monongahela and the Allegheny, right. and uh, that area and, the, and, the, and the, uh, where those rivers in it originated. I never got to the headwaters of those, so I can't tell you. I, I went to Pittsburgh many times where the three rivers, uh, the two Merge, rivers merged yeah. to become the Ohio. Right. Okay, and I went down the Ohio to Louisville, and I went down to Nashville to those rivers, and uh, uh, but I, 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 they do a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, areas of responsibility. But again, my focus was on information systems providing support right. to the Army Corps of Engineers, not what they did, but what I did to provide them support: automation support, communications. Uh, records management, printing and pubs, libraries, uh, uh, audiovisual. Those are my areas of responsibility. So I can talk more about those than, than specifically what the Army Corps of Engineers does. Okay. So you retire from um, at age 55. Yes. That's pretty young to be retired. So what are you going to do with your life after that? <laughs> I think it took me a while to figure that out. Uh, the first few years, I thought, I think I better get back to work, make some money. Uh, but I figured out that I could get along comfortably. I, I live reasonably well. I don't live rich, okay? I live comfortably, my wife and I. Uh, and uh, uh, it was about uh, uh, 19, oh, let's see, 2006, five, that I joined the Marine Corps League. I decided I want to get involved with the Marine Corps League. And uh, so uh, from there, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they assigned me the, uh, the duty of uh, writing the, uh, the newsletter, the monthly newsletter, because I'm an author and publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, I published uh, my family history four editions through uh, 2002. I'm working on the fifth and final one right now, and that's why I'm here in the library, and that's how I met you, okay? Uh, uh, and so the, uh, the fourth edition was published in 02. I published for my Bisbee High School in 2003 an addendum to their, to their uh, uh, class uh, yearbook, which included all the biographies of all the students who wished to participate. And that was about 50 years after they graduated. Oh, okay. that I did that. And about 40-50% uh, of the students per participated in, in what I offered to them. They could put pictures in it and bios. And that was published in 03. Uh, I published for the, uh, the uh, Cincinnati chapter, Sons of the American Revolution. I published for the Ohio Society, uh, uh, a, a register of, uh, of uh, 
uh, personnel would include photographs. I published that in 2000, working with other Cincinnati chapter members. Mm -hmm. In 2005, I came back and offered to do the entire book myself because I thought they might need another one, so I did that in 2005. So I published for them the uh, Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, I published, uh, uh, again, I'm working on the, the family history that's it's, it's going to be four volumes. It's very lengthy. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a member of the uh, uh, Chosen Reservoir Detachment, I'm on their honor guard or color guard. One of uh, Marine Corps has color guard, I guess. The American Legion has honor guard. And so I'm on both units. And so I probably uh, uh, rendered military honors at 40 plus funerals. Uh, either on the rifle squad or for four years for the Chosen Reservoir Detachment, I was the NCOIC for the casket and funeral guard. We would literally provide Marines and dress blues for uh, the head of the casket for uh, Marine Corps funerals. Right. And I really enjoyed doing it and the family loved that we were there doing it. Right. And uh, so I did about 40 funerals for the Marine Corps, uh, probably 10 for the American Legion so far. Uh, uh, I'm always available for uh, rendering honors, rifle salutes, because I'm retired and available. Most people, even in the American Legion, a lot of them are working, so they're not available. So they can usually call on me. To What's a rifle uh, salute? Uh, is where you fire the uh, the three volleys. 21. Uh, uh, 20, yeah. Well, it's not necessarily a 21 gun salute, but it is three volleys of, of shooting. And it may be three rifles, it may be seven rifles. Uh, as, uh, so I, uh, I'm always happy to do that for them. Is that normally a funeral also? At funerals, it's always at funerals. Always? Always, yeah. I've uh, gone with the American Legion up to Dayton where they had combined funerals up there. They had uh, uh, deceased veterans that had been cremated and were in urns sitting at funeral homes. Mm -hmm and other locations, for whatever reason, I don't know, they just weren't. They never claimed. They weren't claimed, okay? So we had combined funerals up there, maybe 10 or 12 funerals. I went to two or three of those in Dayton, and we would, uh, the American Legion from Loveland, we would come up there and render military honors for mm -hmm. those, and that was always a pleasure to do those things. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I stay busy with the Marine Corps League, with the American Legion, what is this uh, Loveland Veterans Memorial? Uh, recently, uh, in, uh, uh, I have a philosophy that I follow with it to uh, do uh, the, uh, by uh, a famous author that is, uh, do, not, uh, do not travel where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail, which is essentially the books that I write. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, late last year, I saw a need. There are uh, pavers in the, the Loveland Veteran Memorial, about 1,500 pavers, right. that you could never find your paper if you went there and looked because there was so, so many of them. Pardon? And they're walked on too. There's so many of them that people couldn't find their papers. So I decided I was going to write a directory of pavers. I produced a book and uh, for the benefit of Loveland. And I coordinated it with the city of Blue Ash. They have a veterans memorial for about 5,000 papers. And I shared my results with them, but my directory uh, uh, is online with the city of Loveland that you can bring it up on your iPad or your cell phone, and you can go find your, plug in the name that you're looking for the veteran, and it will tell you exactly where to find that? it in the, in the uh, memorial. And uh, with that, the, uh, the, uh, the mayor recently asked me to become a member of the Veterans Memorial Committee. So I'm vice chair of that committee now. And, uh, and with that, we promote uh, uh, things in the park for the benefit of the community we're getting, we're planning now for the, the Memorial Day Parade right. is what we're planning for. And also the, the continuous selling of pavers uh, for the community. And I think if they know how to find the paper, that they might be more interested in purchasing a paper. I'm also on the honor guard for Captain Seth Mitchell, which occurs every September. 
the uh, city of Loveland, the, the high school honors uh, Captain Seth Mitchell, Marine Corps captain. He passed away in a, in a helicopter training accident, I think, I don't know if in Afghanistan or one of those countries over there. And uh, so the, uh, the Loveland High School uh, 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 alumni, a few key alumni members who went to school with him, they host a 5K run every year. And uh, because he's a Marine, I encourage my Marine unit to provide the color guard right. for that for that event. So I've been on that color guard uh, uh, team for every year since inception. And the family knows me personally because I'm the one person, one Marine that doesn't change every year. I'm always there. Yeah. And uh, so uh, those are the things I like to do. Well, there's another item here too that seems the chosen news. What is this? Chosen Reservoir Detachment, the Chosen News. Uh, back in- uh, And the Chosen- The Reservoir. Chosen News was a newsletter. I was assigned uh, because the, the previous uh, individual doing that was gonna back away from the table. They needed a volunteer to do it. And so I was volunteered to do it because I knew I was an author and publisher. And uh, so for six years, I wrote the Chosen Newsletter uh, for uh, for the our chosen reservoir attachment, which would include pictures and other articles of uh, what the what the detachment did, uh, I documented all our funerals are documented in that newsletter. Are these veterans of the chosen reservoir? Negative. No, we're just uh, every Marine Corps detachment. They'll have names for their detachments, just like the American Legion has a name for their detachment or post. And ours was uh, the chosen new, uh, the chosen uh, reservoir detachment. I think they were established about 97, 98. And I didn't join them till 05 mm -hmm. is when I joined them. But I was uh, volunteered to do the newsletter and I, I got into it and I really enjoyed doing it. I probably had a following of 100 Marines and families that followed my newsletter. I would email it out or, or send what actual hard you, copy. What subjects do you cover in your newsletter? I cover uh, any subject. That the, that the detachment participated in, uh, Memorial Day parades, 4th of July events, uh, any special events. Uh, we, had, uh, we would go shooting at a, uh, at a, at a private range. Uh, one of the Marines had a large farm. We'd go shooting there. I would be the photographer taking all the pictures and I'd go back and write a lengthy pictorial article about the event. And uh, uh, when I did funerals, I would do uh, prepare military obituaries and those are interesting. I can take a civilian obituary, and if it involves a veteran, I can wrap military uh, iconic images around it and uh, his units. I learned uh, through uh, uh, one of the, uh, there's a website, uh, I don't, Medals of America, I think. I don't know if you've ever been What's on it. What's the name of it? Medals of America. Medals, I, I think something like that. They will let you build a ribbon, a row of ribbons uh, for medals. Uh, and many of the veterans that I, uh, I was the, uh, worked with the uh, rendered honors for, they had uh, many rows of ribbons or maybe 10, 12, 14 ribbons, medals. And you could create a ribbon row in, in that uh, product. Mm -hmm. And in theory, they would, they, you would then purchase those, uh, those, uh, those rows uh, and they would send them to you. What I would do is I would, I would create that using their software. I would create the image of the rows of ribbons right. and then copy it. And put it on the news. And not in or the in news, obituary. but in his obituary. Yeah. And so the family would see it and they would enjoy it. My one problem was I'm colorblind. And I had trouble at, uh, determining the colors of some of these medals. I could, I could look at the medals, and a lot of the medals in the, in the veterans' uh, medal wrap were faded. And I couldn't tell the covers. So that's where I got my, my wife to come look, help me, and I would have her tell me what colors they were, and we would match that to the, the medal in the book that right. they were trying to sell. Right. And so with that, I could create the metal ribbons. And I had some experts in, in medals that would, would know what medals that a veteran was authorized, even if they didn't have them on their medal rack. And I had some, some, uh, some experts, a chief warrant officer, who yeah. gave me some good advice on medals, you know, longtime Marine veteran that uh, I, would, uh, I would ask for his advice, make sure I was doing it correctly and I had the correct medals there. 
And, uh, and, uh, but with that, the family liked it because I could, uh, uh, all the divisions that the, uh, the Marines participated from first through sixth Marine division, if they were in any one of them, I could put that on that military obituary. Mm -hmm. And I could put his regiment or brigade on there. Uh, and uh, I would add information uh, based upon what limited, I, I could look at DD-214s and interpret that information and right. apply that to the military obituary. And so they appreciated that. And that's what I published in the newsletter would be the military obituary, not the civilian obituary. Mm -hmm. That's the starting point, not the ending point. They liked it. And so, uh, Brian, do you have any questions at this point? Just have a couple of questions. Sure, Mike. I mean, your father was a military Guy. I mean, did you think growing up you wanted to go into the military? Was that of interest growing up, or no? It it really wasn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't have uh, uh, much uh, interaction with my father for the military. He didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it. I tell you what, when I was ready to go in the military, I looked at the Army uniform, the Marine Corps uniform, and said, "I want to be a Marine." Those dress blues are sharp. I think I I really didn't think I had. I didn't have anything against the Army, I just, the Marines had a, a better looking uniform. And so I went that route. Uh, one thing of interest uh, later on, I found that when I got a complete copy of his service record. When he retired from the military of Fort Huachuca, Arizona, he was assigned to the 73rd Signal Battalion in Fort Huachuca. And when he retired from them in 1957, I was stationed with the 73rd Signal Battalion in Germany, in uh, Zweibrück in Germany. <laughs> he didn't make note of it to me. It was later on when I saw his service record that he was a member of that unit. Now, I was a member of that unit, but I was a civilian member of that unit. He just didn't talk much, did he? he no, he just didn't. No, I, uh, my mother, gave me, when he passed away later on in life, she gave me a lot of his items, uh, weapons and otherwise, and uh, she, she gave me a, a samurai sword and some other uh, Japanese weaponry that he, he acquired before the end of the war. I have the actual receipts where he acquired these things before the end of the war, uh, issued by uh, uh, the uh, uh, MacArthur's command in Japan. I, I have the actual paperwork showing that he was assigned, he was, he was awarded these articles. And your father spoke? Fluent Japanese. He spoke fluent Japanese, and my, I, my, my second mother spoke quite a bit of Japanese, not as fluent as he did, because she did go over there in, in, uh, in uh, Japan later on in years. I don't know what years they were. Was, uh, was your dad there with MacArthur when he took over as? Uh... Not early on, later on. Later on. I, uh, I have pictures of him. He has the, uh, I have photographs of him with his, uh, his, his patch. Uh, MacArthur's patch is GHQ, General Headquarters. And I have a picture of him wearing that patch. And uh, 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 I, have, uh, I had a Marine who is a, an expert, a uh, wood uh, uh, expert in, in, in building wood, wooden items. And I had, he built a, a sword case for me uh, to hold the samurai sword. And I got his pictures in it. And I got his patches in it. And, and it, it, uh, it's locked, it sits behind a quarter inch plexiglass. Yeah. And uh, so while my grandsons, they, they say one day they're gonna inherit it, they may not inherit the key to the, to the, to the device. To the, that will go to the mother, okay? Well, you, you can't break into that thing. Yeah. Was your dad in Korea? Yes, he was in Korea. Uh, how long he was over there, I don't know. Uh, but he was at Pearl Harbor, he was at uh, Fort Benning, uh, he was in Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know exactly. I never really lived with him as, as when I was old enough to understand what was going on. I lived with my mother. And what, you know, is, what is your uh, mother's name? Uh, my f biological mother, who I love dearly, uh, was Victorine Louise Williams. Right. My adopted mother uh, uh, is uh, Patricia Jane uh, Gallatin Galladay. She and married my dad in 1951. So she was my my uh, stepmother from 1951 till 2008 she when had, she adopted me. Oh, and she's still with you? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. We're going out to see her next month. 
Uh, she'll be celebrating her 95th birthday, and I'll be celebrating my 75th. And, Outstanding. Uh, yeah. Well, she'll love this interview then. Uh, she could very well. Yeah, I love her dearly. We we always have a good time out there. She, uh, they moved out to uh, Fort Huachuca to uh, she. They moved to Bisbee, Arizona, instead of Sierra Vista, which is outside Fort Huachuca. Uh, they moved to Bisbee, Arizona, and she's been living there ever since. Uh, yeah, since about 1955. I lived uh, out there when I was there in, in uh, 58. I lived in Bisbee for about a year. And then my dad took a job with a uh, guy named Hershey. He raised, he was a millionaire. He raised Hershey, uh, he raised Herefords. And he, he did, I can't tell you exactly what he did, but he did a lot of the administrative work my dad did. And so I lived on a Hershey ranch, on a Hereford ranch, uh, and uh, uh, for about two years out there mm -hmm. in uh, Bisbee. Uh, well, it's between Bisbee and Fort Huachuca is where it's at. And uh, later on, it was renamed as a single star ranch because uh, one star general purchased it. Oh, okay. And so it's renamed the single star. Hershey has since passed away. And uh, uh, But I used to uh, travel about 100 miles a day when I went to high school and I went to Sierra Vista to work. And then I came home to the ranch at night. So about a 100 mile circuit each day, going to school, work, and home. And, uh, well, uh, obviously, you're. you're you're a military uh, historian, you do a lot of research. I was curious when you started to do that, was that even before you retired, were you doing that? Or is that more something you did after you retired? It was after I retired. I started writing the book uh, about 94. My dad got me started with genealogy in uh, November of 88. And what I didn't know was he was very poor health. He passed away the following May. And uh, so in November 88, he called me up from Texas to Kansas, and we had a, a little family reunion up there. Peggy, my, uh, my, uh, my future uh, second mother, uh, then my stepmother and him. And he showed me all the research he'd been doing for 30, 40 years. But he, he'd doing you know, the old fashioned way. Uh, you know, and uh, he, he had me back to about 1850. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so once he got me started, uh, I had him back another hundred years in about six months before he passed away. I had him back to the Revolutionary War. And he was just tickled that I took him back that far. And uh, uh, so it wasn't until 1994 that I wrote the first edition of the book and then 95, 96, the next two. And I see the 95 editions here in the library is the one I donated to the library. But it was, it was while writing the book and doing the research, I started noticing all these family members were in the military. And I said, I'm gonna start writing another section on those family members that are in the military and start highlighting that. I brought excerpts from those three books today. And uh, I go back to the Revolutionary War. We may have a, a dozen uh, family members in the Revolutionary War. My fourth and fifth generation great-grandfathers were in that war and a uh, fourth generation great, great grand uncle. And, and then we had members in the War of 1812, and then uh, we get into the Civil War. I probably have 75 family members documented in the Civil War. Two thirds of them fought for the South. Uh, and that's what I was doing today was taping. Uh, I was sent a videotape of a, of a Memorial Day ceremony for a Confederate veteran in Wamego, Kansas. So I was sitting here today converting that to digital so I can upload it to Ancestry.com. And the family members can then enjoy the same video I've been looking at for 10, 20 years. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, as part of the, uh, the family history, I, I, I come forth to World War II. World War I, I've documented. Uh, World War II, Korea. My brother was in Korea uh, in the Navy. Uh, and then I come into Vietnam and, uh, and uh, 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 all the military activities since then that people let me know that they were in those events. Uh, in the military section, I only record military, uh, I have photographs of military uh, gravestones of, of, of men in their uniform. Uh, Civil War, I have my fourth generation great grandfather in the Revolutionary War. I have a picture of him as a major. Okay, it was a painting, and I was given a copy of the painting. Uh, 
uh, not an actual physical copy, but a digital photograph of it. And so that's in the book. And a lot of Civil War veterans are in there. I also have the blacks, African American are in there. I don't differentiate, they're a gala day, they're in my book, whether they're black, white, whatever. They're in my book and I'm documenting all of them uh, in, the, uh, in the military section. Uh, I also document them in the census research I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, things we did in 2010, we did a, a family reunion in Fort Valley, Virginia which is part of the Shenandoah Valley, and we, we dedicated uh, gravestones for Revolutionary War ancestors. We had a good turnout. That's all, uh, the photographs are on findagrave.com. You can eat, get to them there and you can see them. Uh, uh, I've, uh, I've documented a lot in Find the Grave. Uh, in, the, in the Civil War, we had uh, some famous military ancestors. Uh, if you follow Gettysburg at all, the third day of the battle, when the Confederates attacked Culp's Hill, one of my distant cousins was the commander of the 33rd Virginia Infantry that attacked from the east side up Culp's Hill. Mm -hmm. He was also the commander at Antietam and wounded both times. Not wounded at Antietam, not at, not at Gettysburg. Uh, but many of the other uh, 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 ancestors were in, a lot of them were in the Stonewall Brigade, either in the infantry or the cavalry. What was, it, what was the nomenclature of that, the, the sixth? Did you say, or 68th, or what? Uh, what brigade was that? Oh, uh, the Stonewall Brigade yeah. was the name of it. Uh, the, uh, the 33rd Virginia Infantry, the 18th Virginia Cavalry, uh, were in it, and there's some of the other numbers. I, I don't have them, they don't come to mind. I'm a member of Sons of the Confederate Veterans of the Civil War. I'm also a, a recent member of the Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, so mm -hmm. I'm on both sides. 33rd and 18th, uh, yeah. Okay, 33rd Virginia is the, uh, uh, one of the units in the Stonewall Brigade. <laughs> they, they were one of the units uh, in the, the first battle of, uh, of Bull Run Manassas. They were one of the units that uh, attacked the unions and captured some cannon because at that time, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, both the Confederate and the Union, they had mixed uniforms. And uh, it finds out that, uh, I'm watching another uh, Civil War thing. They, uh, at, right at that battle, they, they were wearing the uniforms they wore as part of the militia. Okay, and some of them were butternut and some of them were blue union. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they hadn't changed their, their color of the uniform. So they're wearing a blue union, but they're part of the Confederacy attacking a union outfit, which wasn't necessarily all blue. Right. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I uh, I'm reading Shelby Foote right now. I'm finishing the third volume of that book by Shelby Foote mm -hmm. on the whole Civil War. It's taken me a while to get through that, but uh, uh, I enjoy that. I, yeah, I read a lot of Civil War. Yeah, this is a narrative uh, without footnotes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I just got one last question. Certainly. Uh, how did you get involved with like that with the American Union, the whole doing the uh, <laughs> uh, okay, as far as the American Legion, I, uh, I uh, to step back one, I, in, in 05 I decided it was time I want to get back with a military unit and, and do some participation, uh, started to get the patriotic roots. And uh, so I, I found an Ameri a Marine Corps League unit that was in Morrow, and so I joined them in 05. In 08, <clears throat> I happened to become, I happened to be a, uh, the leader of an organization, a political action committee that was against the, uh, the, 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 the levy being, being put forth by the Loveland High School system. I, I was in opposition to it because I thought it was quite expensive. It was something like a $26 million school levy. And I'm a taxpayer in Loveland, property taxpayer, and I thought that was quite exorbitant. So uh, I, I led a group of uh, individuals to defeat that levy. And out of that, I decided I wanted to host a, a, a party to, to uh, celebrate the fact that we, 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 uh, we opposed the levy and won. And out of that, I went to the American Legion. They had a hall. Yeah. And they say, we'll let you have the hall free because we're a property taxpayer also in Loveland. 
and, and we, we appreciate the fact that you, uh, you, uh, you defeated the levy. So he gave me the hall free, and he said, oh, by the way, you're a veteran, aren't you? They said, yes. I said, Vietnam era. He says, I want you to join the American Legion. And so I did. That's how I joined the American Legion. I wasn't planning on doing it. He just, he signed me up and said, here, here's the card, fill it out, and give me your money, and now you're a legionnaire. And so with that, I joined the American Legion. And I've enjoyed it. I've, uh, when did you start being part of the, like, you know, funeral uh, the, uh Okay, with the, uh, uh, the casket of funeral guard, I saw a need. Uh, we had some Marines within our unit that passed away. And so some of the senior Marines of the unit would call us out for a casket guard for that Marine in our unit. And I enjoyed that. I thought that was very nice. It was, uh, the families loved it, that we had a, a Marines in dress blues there. Not the dress blues that you see with active duty Marines, but a modified version of that uniform. And I saw the need that, hey, I think we should do this for all Marines in the city of Cincinnati or in the, in the counties that we did Butler, Warren, uh, we did some of Claremont, we did all of Hamilton. Okay, any deceased Marine in those locales, I would call the cemetery, uh, fun I'd call the funeral home, and see and confirm that it was actually a Marine that we were having a funeral for. And once they confirmed that, I would volunteer my unit. I, I had about four or five, six Marines that from my detachment, I could, if I could assemble one or two, I could have two or three Marines standing a, an hour or two as a casket and funeral guard for a deceased Marine. Uh, and so I organized that unit and I pushed it from uh, 08 to 2012. I had to terminate because uh, my hip went out and I had to put a prosthetic hip in. And uh, so I just couldn't stand 15, 20 minutes, half hour, an hour. Uh, I, I couldn't do that anymore. And, and when I stopped doing it, most of the others, Marines, uh, uh, they, they did not continue it. But I had some, uh, in that case, I had some famous Marines we stood duty for. I had one, there was, uh, were the, uh, the Navajo Code Talkers. I, uh, I uh, went to a funeral for a Marine who was a sergeant who guarded the Code Talker. And he, he's in one of my uh, obituaries on my website, Chosen Reservoir Detachment. You'll see his obituary out there. There was nobody at his funeral. You know, he was elderly, World War II. Right. I, th I don't know if he went Guadalcanal or what, but he was, uh, he was a sergeant that guarded the code talker. And uh, it, uh, there was nobody there but us, the, uh, the, the uh, casket guard. And uh, so when they needed somebody to carry the casket to the hearse, we had to do it. Right. There was nobody there. So we had four of us, two of the funeral personnel, and, and we two casket guards carried the, carried the casket and put it in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the hearse. Because you know the, a lot of these Marines are so old, there's just nobody there to come to the funeral. Right. But I had, uh, I had another occasion where I had, I had a family asked us to, uh, to uh, in our dress blues, uh, carry the casket to the hearse. He wanted to have a picture of three Marines carrying the, his dad and three of his children. And so we had 20 year olds on one side and we had 60 and 70 year olds on the other side and a 50 year old was taking the picture, okay? And later on I figured out that this doesn't make sense. I can't carry this casket anymore for a 50 right. year old. He ought to be carrying his dad's casket, okay? So that was the last time I volunteered to do it, okay? Right. Uh, and uh, but he got he got his picture and we did it. But uh, I I don't carry caskets anymore. I, I can't. Too old, two back surgeries and prosthetic hip and other yeah. problems. I I don't do the. I can't even do a one mile march in a parade anymore. I, yeah. I just my body won't do it. So I I drive a vehicle carrying the flags on the back. And they, I do it for the American Legion on Memorial Day, and I do it for the Marines on Fourth of July, and then I, I, I can do the parade as a color guard for Captain Seth Mitchell, because you only walk about 50 yards. I can carry the flag for that. And I enjoy doing that. So I, I enjoy doing those things. I like putting up flags. Yeah. I always have flags in my car. 
I, all the fly, all the mailboxes on my street have uh, have uh, cemetery flags on them. I maintain all those flags. Uh, I put up a flag today at Taco Bell down on Lovely Madeira. Their flag was in disrepair, so I swapped it out and ran up a five by eight flag. They appreciated that. I like doing those things. Yeah. I got a flag. I'm taking my mother in Arizona, and uh, I buy a lot of my flags. The best place to buy them is uh, is uh, Brad Wenstrup. Our congressman, I buy all my flags from him. What company does he have? What company? Yeah. He's our congressman, I know second that. Ohio district. I know that. What do you mean? You company? buy them from him. What do you Right mean? from his website in, in the Congress, on the House. Oh, he sells them? Sells them directly. I used to buy them from Gene Schmidt. Uh, 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 they sell them directly from their website in the Congress, in the House. Okay, so I get them at a reasonable price, thirteen dollars for a three by five nylon. Oh, really? And a four by six and a five eight. Now all nylon flags. So you go to bradwinstrip.com. Uh, his website, Congressman Brad Winstrip. His website. He's got a sub page there for flags. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, uh, the. Uh, the uh, the sons of the Union veterans, they know that I have these flags, and so they'll buy them from me. And uh, so I'm not, it's not like I'm trying to make a dollar off this. I, I'm just reselling or I give them away. Sure. I okay, today that. I gave one to Taco Bell, and uh, yeah. I've got the old one ready to be given to the American Legion for, for proper destruction. Right. We do that. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> uh, we have our flag uh, retirement ceremony every year in june in june it's flag day flag day flag day and, uh, but uh i have uh, i have a marine in my unit uh he's a uh, a a mustang enlisted and he retired as a major and he's commander of the vfw post in morrill he gave me a gross of uh, cemetery flags 144. Mm -hmm. and i put them up on all the mailboxes in my neighborhood because his daughter lives at the end of my street uh, and she's got a flag on her mailbox yeah so he takes care of me anytime i need flags he will give me more yeah. i'm still working on that gross of flags yeah and i've got a neighbor that when i go when i pass on he's already agreed to continue that tradition i'll give him the, the rest of the flags and he'll maintain he's a civilian <laughs> yeah yeah well, Brian? Yeah. Thank you. well we've about um we come to the end of the year, but this has been a delightful interview. Well, Good. And, it's been uh, a pleasure. It's, I want to thank yeah. you for the interview. Yeah. I want to thank you for your service to our country and the military. And thank you for saying so. And I want to thank you for your patriotism and yeah. everything you do for our veterans today. Well, we try. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean it.